you really want is probably build it yourself. So that's what I've been doing for years. You learn on a TIG world and, and uh, you get to acquire the equipment to build all that stuff and it's not so bad, it's not so hard. All right, so now, Tim, what goes in the preparation to get that car ready for a weekend of drag racing? Um, we'll usually, we pull the, we'll, we'll, uh, if, we, if we haven't pulled the heads off of it, we'll usually just pull the rocker covers off of it and go through the valves and um, check the car over from one end to the other. I mean, we'll check every single bolt, nut, and um, check over anything, that, any of the welds that, that may, you know, that are critical um, check the brakes and, and make sure everything is, is good and everything is safe. It's all, to me, it's all about safety. And as far as getting the engine ready, the engine is, you know, we keep, keep an eye on it. We, on alcohol, we'll tear it apart every three runs and look at it, look at things. And, uh, on nitro, it's just about got to be every one to two runs. You got to tear it apart and look at everything. So we'll pull the pan, look at the bearings, look at the rods and the mains. And, uh, push pistons out of it and make sure everything is good with the rings and, and uh, everything, uh, cam and lifters, all that stuff. We can try and inspect all that stuff as frequently as possible. When you're on alcohol, it's not, not as hard. Uh, I mean, it's not as, uh, it's not as much work as it is with the nitro. But it's still, you got to stay on top of it if you're going to, you're going to, you want it to stay together. So, and you can get, you know, you can get a lot of use out of one of them as long as you take care of it. You change the oil, an alcohol change oil every three runs. On nitro, you got to change it every run. Change the nitro, change the oil and the filter every run. And uh, like I say, run the valves, check the valves. And the, the blower, after it gets about, after it gets about eight or ten, twelve runs on it, it's it's you know you're checking the boost on it and see if the boost starts to drop and it's time to change the blowers. And we keep the spare blower so we can put another blower on. And then uh, what they say is try to keep one in the air all the time. So what you've done is you got you got the blower on the car and the blower that just came off. And you're shipping it out to get it rebuilt and uh, and run the one that's on the car until the other one comes back. So you're, you're keeping a fresh blower on it all the time. That gets expensive too. Between not just having it rebuilt but shipping it and having it to get it out to somebody and having them do it. It's expensive. But uh, in the clutch, you've got to go through the clutch every run. You know, uh, every single run, you'll lose some of those clutch discs. Transmission, um, you have to uh, keep the shifter pods adjusted and keep an eye on that. Change the oil in the transmission frequently. And, um, you know, you just got to keep, keep uh, ahead of, trying to keep ahead of the, everything. Always looking for that weak link. You know, making sure the drive shaft, everything, the couplers are good and tight and everything's good in there. Because, well, I'll tell you, one little thing can go wrong and you can lose everything over over a little. You, you hear that old adage, well, you know, that I, I lost everything over a 29 cent part. It can happen. So, you guys try and stay ahead of it. All right. So, now, Tim, what, what, are, uh, what are some of your favorite tracks to run on? Um, I really like Eddyville. It's a, it's a, for a local track, Eddyville, it's a little bit narrow, but it, uh, the, the track has really got good bite. And uh, they, they say that's the track with the teeth. And they're right. Um, Havana is not a bad track at all. I like Havana. And, um, gosh, uh, Cordova, Cordova is a good track. Byron is a good track. Uh, uh, Byron, it's been a while since I've been at Byron, but, uh, like I say, Byron was my home track because we got my license at. It was, boy, back then that was the widest track in the world. I mean, it was bigger than, it was wider because they used to run four wide at Byron a long, long, long time ago. In fact, I think they had published a picture of that in National Dragster where uh, they were running four wide at Byron. And uh, I, I, how many times they did it, I don't know. I never have. But uh, that track was seemed very wide and um oh gosh Joliet, st louis those are all excellent excellent tracks but probably my favorite i don't know i'd, I'd say my favorite probably uh 
probably St. Louis. Yeah, I like that. A really nice track. Good traction. Visibility is really good. Have but, you? Um, a lot of shut off. Have you ever been to Martin, Michigan? No, I've never run at Martin. I, I, we went there, and when we got there, we got rained out. That was back in the circuit days, and we would go to Quaker City and uh, uh, Cincinnati. A lot of, I got in a real bad funny car wreck in Cincinnati in about 1979. I had my partner and me had bought a bought a car from uh, Pee Wee Wallace and Dave Prime. Dave Pee Wee Wallace used to drive it. It was the Virginian, or Virginia, and. Uh, First time we ran, it was a nitro car, and we'd uh, changed over an alcohol car and put his alcohol engine in it. And went to, uh, we, first place we ran it was at Byron, and then the next weekend we went to Cincinnati to run it at Edgewater, and uh, the guy who was racing uh, came across the center line and ran into the back end of me and shoved me through the guardrail. It destroyed the car, uh, other than the cockpit, but everything else was gone. And uh, I got a broken neck out of it, and um, it, it fractured the spine, it fractured a bone in my neck, and uh, so that put me out for a while. But the guy that hit me was Herb Rogers, and he was an NHRA, kind of a big deal for a while there. But he he passed away, but um, that was that was devastating to have to lose that car, and it was a car second only second time I ever driven that car, and. Uh, we had Larry Engler rebuild it. Larry Engler used to do all the chassis work for Tim Gross. And he um, he rebuilt that entire car. And then that became the, that was the next Z-Bart mods. It was blue and, it was blue and two different colors of yellow and candy apple red. And it was a beautiful, beautiful car. And um, that car, my partner uh, decided he didn't want to race flying cars anymore, so we had to sell that car and bought a top fueler. And I didn't want to drive a top fueler, so I just bought another funny car. <laughs> so he went on with the top fueler, and I went on with the funny car. So. <coughs> but that uh, that Monza, or that uh, Vega, the uh, one that got destroyed, that was there's a that was a buyer or a Byron deal, you know. Run that up, so now, um, where where do you get all your fire safety equipment from, Tim? Um, you know, my my coat and pants. I use two piece. I, I don't really care for the one piece. I, I use a two piece, and that's a Simpson suit. And I do a lot of DJ. I got DJ gloves and DJ seat belts, and uh, but um, I think that. The parachutes are both Simpson chutes. No, they're not. They're um, maybe they're Stroud chutes, but um, most of the safety equipment comes from Simpson and DJ. Some impact stuff. I got some impact stuff. So a little bit of everything. You know, I I, I have a pair of boots that I love. This pair of boots, and they're a different brand. I mean, they're. I think my boots are instead of D. I got a brand new pair of DJ boots. And they don't fit as well as these Simpson boots do. So I wear the Simpson boots. And then the gloves are older. I got a brand new pair of Simpson gloves, but I don't like them. So I wear the older Simpson gloves. They're still legal. And, uh, you know, and you'll have that. But you you got to wear what's comfortable. And uh, that's what I do. And now uh, I got an impact, uh, an impact helmet. So everything that I wear is comfortable. So. You can't be, you know, you got to be, when you're in that car, you got to be comfortable. You can't be preoccupied with, well, I wish this fit better. I just don't feel good. And then, and then you've got a driving job to do that's really important. So I think it's important that, you're, that you be comfortable. So what what kind of tires are you running on on a funny car? Uh, good, good years. we got good years on the front and back both. And uh, I know there's a lot of tire deals out there, but I've always used new tires. And um, gosh, I've got two or three sets of new. I've got three sets of new Goodyear slips, and the tires on the front are brand new, and they're they're all Goodyear stuff. So 
know, they, they seem to work well for what we're doing right now. They seem to work fine. We get to the point when they're when they don't work, they're not doing the job. Then we'll change. But right now, they seem to be working well for us. All right. So now, Tim, what what would you consider to be uh, the milestones of your drag racing career? It's more, to me, it's more about the equipment, more about the, the cars. And instead of the, um, you know, yeah, I'd love to, you know, love to, I'd love to do an exhibition at Indy for the U.S. Nationals, do a half-track burnout. I'd love to do that. That would be a milestone for me. That would be, that would be huge. But that's probably not going to happen, but you never know. You never know. The right person sees it and the right person asks you. That's why I, I had gotten into that deal with McCormick Place, and that was just being at the right place at the right time. And I got so much out of that. Um, gosh, it was it was great. Um, we got so much publicity out of that deal, um, and it was just a, like I said, being the right place at the right time. And I'd like, to, like I said, I'd like to do that. I'd like to do an exhibition deal in Indy for the U.S. Nationals, but. Uh, you know, you see the uh, Manuk and those guys doing their doing their little their runs, and they're really not they're not knock you out of the seat runs, but they're they're just just the fact that they're there, and you can you can see it. You know, they're cool to watch, and um, yeah, that would be great for me if that one ever happened. But um, we've done some. You know, we've been to uh, uh, Cordova for the World Series several times, and those were those were very memorable for me. Uh, I had a guy up there that uh, one of the announcers, and I told him, I said, I've got some Seabark people coming. Can you talk the car up a little bit? Talk us up a little bit. He talked us up so much it was actually it was embarrassing. And he uh, he made we, he made a tape of it for us, and uh, the Seabark people didn't know what to think. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it was that was really something. Uh, yeah, there's uh, there's been quite a few of those deals like that. But um, yeah, yeah. You you mentioned the World Series, the drag, World Series. That's this weekend. That's this weekend. Yep, yeah, and we're not there. But that, my my father is on his deathbed in the hospital right now and uh, I've got to tend to that this weekend so I've got to, he's getting moved to back to a nursing home and they've pretty much given up on him so he's 95 years old and he was my biggest fan he used to help me a lot going all over the weird parts of the country doing match races in the weirdest places you know old landing strips and practically match racing on dirt roads and you know um many many years ago and uh, he really enjoyed it well now i've I got to be by his side because he's uh he's not going to be with us much longer so we didn't go to the series this year we didn't go last year but i would really like to get back to the series uh, nine, nine. So that's, that's kind of that's kind of something we're shooting for for next year Ninety-five years—that's a long time to live, though. It sure is, and he's been a gearhead every minute that I can remember of it. He, him and my mom used to race stock cars, and they were—we uh, got pictures of them. Uh, my mom going around the, the stock car track with the checkered flag, and uh, my dad was tuning the car, and then my dad would get in the car and race his race. So that was a long—that was way before I was even thought of. But he started me out. We started out in go karts. Started racing go karts when I was nine, and that's kind of where the racing started at. And uh, then that '55 Chevy came along when I was fifth. I was actually 16, just turned 16 years old. And uh, tilt front end, straight axle, 55 auto Albert wheelbase '55 Chevy. And uh, that was a Peoria drag strip. Talk about racing in a cornfield, that was about it. 
Yeah, but of course, after your dad's gone, he'll he'll still be there with you in spirit all the time. Oh yeah, yep, he sure will. He sure will. Yep. Oh. Yeah, I wish I could give him more time. You know, if I could, that would be a milestone for me to be able to give him some time. This doesn't happen that way. So now, Tim, throughout your uh, whole drag racing career, have you had any accidents? Yeah, I've, like I said, I, I flipped that Chevy 2 down at Havana. Oh, that yeah, was, yeah. Gosh, that had to be in 19... Oh, man, that had to be in probably 72. And then uh, I crashed a funny car in Cincinnati in uh, 79. And that's really the only two uh, crashes I've had. That funny car crash was a bad one. That was pretty bad. And then the flipping the Chevy 2, there was nothing left of that car either, but uh, I walked away from that one. The one in Cincinnati, I wasn't that lucky. And uh, boy, I tell you, I sure don't want to do it again. <laughs> yeah, not so you tend to... You, and the older you get, the, the safer you tend to be. I mean, you when you're young, you you're just a you know a bull, and it doesn't matter. You know, you're gonna you're gonna be a win no matter what. When you get older, you're more safety conscious. You still want to win, but uh, you want to make sure the car's not gonna fall apart under you. Well, knock on wood, you won't have any accidents. Yeah, a lot of a lot of these a lot of these accidents you see these days, you, you actually you actually see how good the safety equipment is on these cars by the drivers walking away from these cars. That's right, that's right. Yeah, and, they, and they're so strict with that, they they make you update that stuff and have it recertified. A lot of the stuff is certified every year, and uh, uh, and then every two years. Some stuff is every five years, but. Um, the majority of it is one in two years recertification, and it's got to be done, or you're not going to run it. And you got to show all that identification when you go to the track. You got to show that you know the tracks are good about it. They they uh, say, well, look, buddy, your seat belts are one month out of date, so you're not going to run unless you borrow a set of seat belts from somebody that are current. Wait a minute, just one month? Yep, that's what that date means. If it's, a, if it's out of date, you don't use it. And that's happened to me before. At Union Grove. And Union Grove wasn't even an NHRA track, but they were really sticking to the rules. I had to borrow a set of belts from somebody. And most racers are real good about it. You know, if they've got what you need. And this guy had just blown his engine up the run before, and he wasn't going to be running. He didn't have another engine, so he wasn't going to be running, so we took the belts out of his car. And that was actually the old Blue Max car. But, um, yeah, they're, they're really sticklers on safety. The fire bottles have to be dated. They've got to be current. And they're really watch that, too. Okay, so so now we're approaching uh, fun questions. Not, not that talking about drag racing is not fun, but... It, it, Here's some fun questions. Uh, besides drag racing, Tim, you have any other hobbies outside of drag racing? Mm. Yeah, I don't run as far as street cars and stuff like that. You know, not really. I mean, I do, you know, build a little, like our, I told you about our little 34 Ford pickup is a little street car for us. And that's, that's kind of a hobby. That's a hobby. And the golf cart thing, that's a hobby. And, you know, it's about it. Well, me and my wife like to go on vacation, um, you know, get some time away. What do, what's and, your favorite uh, favorite vacation spot? Uh, actually, we've been debating over that. and it's, it, Florida keeps winning out. And uh, we've been to Vegas several times and, been, you know, been to quite a few different places. We go up north and, um, but 
Florida is actually our favorite this year. And, we're, and we've been trying different places in Florida, but we're staying away from the ocean. Don't need any shark bites. Stay away from that. <laughs> Don't want to be a, a meal for a shark. Right. So, yeah, we'll go to St. Petersburg this time. Now, you, yeah, and we don't go. You don't go a lot. Don't go for a long time. You know, just a short week or so, week to ten days, something like that. So, do you have any kids? Yes, I've got a daughter that's forty-one or forty. Oh, man, forty-four. Forty-four-year-old daughter, and I've got two sons, and they're uh, thirty-five and thirty-eight. And neither one of them are drag racers. So what? My daughter about- either. So what do the kids think about uh, dad dad drag racing when they're growing up? <laughs> well, my da- my daughter was really exposed to it a lot, and believe it or not, I don't think she's only she's only come to watch me once. But uh, it just does not interest her. But she's there for support. I mean, she'll she'll well, good luck, Dad. I want you to be safe. Good luck. But I'm not coming to watch you. <laughs> and my boys, my two boys are, are uh, they love it. They, they, one of them is, uh, likes to go sit in the stands. He doesn't want to be around the car. He doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to be in the staging lanes. He just wants to go sit in the stands and watch him. He loves that. And then the other one is more mechanically inclined. He likes to have his hands right in there with it. Or he's right in there with you. So, but I've, mentioned driving to both of them and neither one are interested whatsoever. <laughs> so, but that's okay. Yeah. So, so when, when they were younger you used, to, you used to take the kids with you? Yeah, I would I would try and take uh, my daughter with me but she, she really wasn't really enthused about going. It was a, a lot of noise. It was really noisy and you know, and when you're when you're running a car, you don't have time for to to watch your kids or watch your dog or you know you're you're busy. You're just busy tending to the car and getting the car ready for the to run it and make sure everything is right. And, and um, you know, you just really don't don't have time for for kids. You know, right there because you're busy, you're just too busy. So she never really wanted to go much anyway. All right. All right so now, through, through, throughout your uh, whole drag racing career, how many uh, trophies have you won? Well, you know, I used to say when we we used to get the trophies years ago, and say, well, you know, I'd show the trophies off. You know, you get back and say, oh, this trophy I got. I say, really? Uh, now you're gonna put salt and pepper on that and eat it? You know, what are you going to do with that trophy? So, and, and uh, with Cordova, Cordova like giving away trophies in advance. Saying, well, you want a trophy or you want the money? I said, you know, you can you can give the trophy to the next guy. I can't use that trophy for anything um, other than a tire stop. I, you know, I need to put fuel in the truck or fuel in the race car, so I'll take the money. So, just we kind of steered away from the trophies. Now, the trophy is not a really big deal anymore. You know, at the tracks where everybody gets paid. And there's people that win, and, you know, or booked in cars get paid. So you don't have a lot of use for trophies anymore. They're not like the, the Wally that John Force has got how many hundreds of them. Yeah. But th- that's, a, that's different. That's very different. So privateers don't, don't really get in on that. So now, Tim, if you were able to do time traveling and go back backwards into time, would you do anything differently with the drag racing career? Yeah, I wouldn't race. I wouldn't race Herb Rogers in Cincinnati. I would have pulled back and let somebody else racing because that's the guy that ran into me and pushed me through the guardrail. That changed a lot of things for me. Destroying that car and getting my neck screwed up, and you know, that really made a big difference. I lost it. Sponsor I had a Chevrolet dealer for a sponsorship, and they were furnishing me with a uh, new truck to use on a yearly basis, and uh, that all went away because of the accident. And, you know, 
So that's one of the things I would have changed. Probably the, the first thing I would have changed is not race that guy. All right. Now, do, do you have a do, do you have uh, one most embarrassing moment on the track that you can think of? Yeah, yeah, Cordova. Um, nice long burn. I was trying to do a really long burnout. Me and another guy in the circuit were kind of had a little side bet going. Who could do the longest, smokiest burnout? And I did a long, long, practically full track burnout at Cordova and backed up, and I got about three-fourths of the way back, and somebody ran out, and, and uh, somebody ran out in front of me and stopped me. Here, I'd run over both parachutes. Parachutes fell out during the burnout, and uh, the car was shaking so hard it shook the chutes out of it, and I ran over both parachutes, and he was, he was begging me to shut it off. I didn't know what had happened, and I had to pull off the side of the track and get out of the car, and get on the other side of the guardrail so the other car could make his pass because he'd already done his burnout and he's backed up and staged and waiting for me. So, yeah, that was embarrassing. But Cordova, you know, they, those guys really run a, uh, run a tight ship, and that's what they did. They, they you have to get out of that car and get, a, get away from the track, you know, get on the other side of the guardrail. And uh, now it's guard wall. Back then it was guard rail. And uh, it was for safety, so that guy could make his pass. That was embarrassing. All right, so now but go go ahead. Stuff happens. Yeah. So so now, Tim, what's your what's your favorite food you like to eat? Well, my wife has got me on a strict got me on a pretty strict diet, and actually, it's oatmeal. I know it sounds terribly boring but uh, I've had bypass surgery and uh, I was retaining some water and I had to go to the hospital and and uh, get that taken care of and uh, my sodium level was high and so no more sausage and bacon and stuff for breakfast it's oatmeal so and, and now I've got I've, I've learned to learn to love it so I've lost 30 pounds and kept it off and I'm doing great, and I'm 69 years old. Hey, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yep, yep, sure do, sure do. I, and it's been 16 years since I've had a bypass surgery, and I don't plan on doing it again. So <laughs> I gotta keep healthy to keep getting that license renewed. That license that comes around every two years. That's gotta be renewed. It's due this year. And, and, and without that license, you're not racing without that license. And, and at least you know by eating healthy, you're going to fit in that fire suit all the time. <laughs> That's what I thought when I got in it this year. After losing that weight, I thought, wow, this fire suit fits me better now than it ever has. I wonder why. And now I got, look, I got some extra room in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Except my feet got bigger and I can't hardly get my, can't hardly get my feet down in between the chassis and the transmission. <laughs> but I guess that's one of the things that happens when you get older, your feet get bigger. But that gives you more more room to push the pedal down. <laughs> All right, so what's your favorite beverage you drink? Right now I'm drinking a Diet 7 Up. And I know you're not supposed to drink Diet Soda, but I can't help it. I'm, uh, no, no beer, nothing, that, nothing like that. It's Diet Soda or tea. Now, do you have a favorite movie of all time? Yeah, you know, I like the Reds. Those Red movies with uh, Bruce Willis and... Right. I can't think of anybody else in it, but those, you know, movies I'm talking about. Yeah. I like those movies. They're kind of a semi-comedy drama type thing. I, I like those. I, everything for me is comedy. I love comedy. It's all about comedy. All the movies we have, I think we've got 300, over 300 movies, and 99% of them are comedies. So you like to laugh? Yeah, yeah, I like to laugh. I sure do. La yep. Laughter is the best medicine, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Oh. It's laugh or cry, and I'd rather laugh. <laughs> so, what's your favorite music to listen to? Um. 
me and my wife sit out on the, oh, we've got a wraparound porch on our house, and we sit on the front porch on Sunday mornings and play our music, and I tell you, I really like Jude Cole music, and he's, he's from, from the 80s, and uh, my wife does too, and, every, and uh, said, see if you like this guy, and uh, play that, and boy, she just loves it, Jude Cole music, but, you know, I like Elton John, and all the older stuff, of course, the Beatles, I'm just not a country music guy. I don't like country music at all. But there's a couple of country songs I like. So how do you explain that? <laughs> <laughs> so now, Tim, if you weren't if you weren't a drag racer, what do you think you'd be doing with your life? Uh, I, you know what, Dave? I I don't have any idea. I can't <laughs> imagine me doing anything else. I just can't imagine me doing anything else. I would like to try, yeah, it's still drag racing, though. I always wanted to, I always envied DJ Potter with that motorcycle. I always wanted to do something. I'd like to ride a top fuel bike once. But uh, still drag racing. So I really don't have an answer for that. I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> so how, how important do you think it is for, uh, you know, the kids to come out and watch drag racing in this day and age? I think it's I think it's healthy for the kids to get involved where they've got you know to set their sights on something and say wow boy I love that I wonder wonder what it would take to do that and that's what I was that's where I was at I remember sitting in the stands you know I remember sitting in the stands at Union Grove and uh, I saw um, it was uh, a guy that drove. Uh, Pat's the Ribbon Charger, and uh, they they do do the, the parade, and they would take the cars and the, the tow vehicles out on the track, and they would announce every single car that went down the track, and say this is uh, the guys with the Chicago Patrol and the guys with the Chi Town Hustler, and you know they would announce everybody and who the driver was, and um, they. Uh, they would come down the return road after going down the track. They'd come down the return road in front of the stands so everybody could get a, get a good shot of them. You were ready to take a picture of them. And, and I saw the uh, there was a break in the in the line coming down the return road, and I wondered what it was. And I got you know, just kind of stood up, and everybody was standing up to look. Patch over the charger, fired up the car, and drove it down the return road. And just as he got right in front of where we were sitting at, we were sitting right down as close as I could get. And just as he went past us, he whacked the throttle a couple of times. And that did it for me. That was it. I've got to have a funny car. <laughs> and, you know, kids, and I think kids get that enthused about it. I see the kids that come to the track and they want pictures and they want autographs and they want their picture taken in the car and, you know, thousand questions and, and I always take the time to talk to them and try to explain to them everything that I, I can and uh, boy they just love it and I think it's it's healthy it's it's nonviolent and it's uh, it's expensive but if you want something bad enough you can make it happen and that's exactly what I did I built my first chassis I had bought not my first flying car chassis I had bought a chassis from a local uh, guy of a Bradford and Sloan had a little altered and I bought one of their conduit chassis and I bought a engine from uh, an old gasser guy that was uh, a rival of Ohio George Montgomery and he was a local guy it was Gordon Selkirk I bought his Hemi engine and uh, boy, I had to hock everything I could get my hands on to buy that Hemi put it in that altered and uh Got the thing all together, went to Union Grove, and just about it scared myself to death with that car. The thing was 100-inch wheelbase and, and a blown, injected, alcohol-burning Hemi, and it was all over the place. At the end of that last run, I took off in the right lane, ended up on the left, left side of the track in the grass, sideways on the training wheels, or what they call the training wheels. That was the headers. They had funny car headers on it. And... Uh, I didn't even want to steer it back to the pits. I let somebody else steer it back to the pits. We got home with it that, that weekend. I took the engine out of it and sold it. But no, I don't want no part of this car. And went to Chicago to a BNF aircraft and bought a trailer load of chromoly tubing and brought it home. We got a blueprint and built a funny car. 
that was the first funny car. That was in 70, that would have been 70, 73. Yeah, 73. So kids, you know, if you, if they, you know, if they want something like that bad enough, they can do it. You can just set your mind to it, you can do whatever you want. So do you put a lot of kids in the car in the pit area? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and when we go to the, uh, go to that touch picnic, because that's all, that's all, and these kids are all handicapped. These kids are all uh, heart patients, and that's what this picnic is for, is for, uh, for the heart patients, for uh, OSF, you know, St. Francis Hospital. And um, my wife works there, so <laughs> she's got first hand at that. You know what's going on there, but uh, the kids, yeah, kids like to like to, and I set them in the car, you know, within reason. I won't let them climb all over the car, but put one in at a time so they can get their picture taken. They really like it, and it's strange. The last few races we've, we've been at, we uh, I've got some old handouts from a uh, one of my old Monzas, the old Z Bart Monza from uh, Xenia, Ohio, doing a burnout and. Uh, those are old hand. Those handouts are probably 35, 40 years old, and people are asking for those old handouts instead of the new ones. It's crazy. <laughs> they want those autographed old black and white handouts. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it seems like and then the little kids are asking for the older ones, and it seems like the nostalgia thing is, just affects everybody. <laughs> yeah, you have to mail me one out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I will do that. Yeah, I've got, I've got a bunch of those left. Yeah, I have, I'm, I'm uh, make get some new ones of that same old picture. <laughs> so, yep. So, so Tim, what would you consider to be the fondest memory of your drag racing career? Oh, probably, probably the fans. You know, after you went around and you're coming down the return road and everybody's cheering you and. You know, clapping and whistling and yelling your name and thinking, you know, I know these people. Though. What did I do? I didn't do anything. You know, and you don't think about it when you, you know, during, at least I don't. You know, if you're in, you know, do your burnout and I'm just concentrating on what I've got to do and to do a good job and put on a good show. I don't really think about all the people that are out there watching. And, you know, you can be in front of 25,000 people and, uh, Man, oh man, there were all those people there when they when I came up there and did this burnout. They're here now for some reason, and uh, you know that's that's really <laughs> gratifying. Yep. And the little kids, I like the little kids. They, uh, gee, Mister, I, I remember we did a match race down in Missouri, that Bethany, Missouri, that Thunder Valley. And I swear, this track one one of the guardrails was a tomato fence. And, uh, I mean, this track was dangerous. And uh, we had, I had, uh, I had some, had, I think, 30% nitro in it, 30 or 40% nitro in it. And at the hit, the car went sideways. As soon as I hit the throttle, the car went sideways and mowed down the Christmas tree because the track was so narrow. And uh, that Christmas tree just went flying. And uh, I got the thing, gathered it back up and got it, Straight, and these guys, these people don't care. They want you to get down the track. So I legged it and got down the end of the track, and then couldn't. I, I, the track was so short, couldn't get stopped, and slid sideways in the grass trying to get the thing stopped. And we got back to the trailer and uh, getting it ready for the next round. And one of the little kids came up, wanted a picture. I gave him a picture, and he asked me, he said, "Mister, are you going to run that Christmas tree over again?" I said, "Well, if they put it out there, I'll run it over." <laughs> That was kind of it was kind of embarrassing and funny at the same time. <laughs> a little kid really got a kick out of it. All right, <laughs> <laughs> the guy told me we went, we've gone around to all the bathrooms and robbed all the light bulbs out of the bathrooms so we can get the Christmas tree up again. You're not going to hit it again, are you? <laughs> well, you maybe got to get it out of the way. You know, it's, it's tracks pretty narrow, so yeah, that was that was fun. <laughs> So now, Tim, if people want to find out where you're going to be uh, racing at, what's the best way for people to find out where you're going to be at? Well, we're going to, right, like I say, Dave, what we're doing right now is we're, everything we're doing is testing, but we're, we do have a match race set up with Keith Jackson 
uh, in Havana, in Havana, Illinois, on the 14th of September. So that'll be our next our next race, and beyond or before that is going to be testing. So we're going to try and test this Saturday, depending on what happens with my dad. And uh, if we can't make it this weekend, because next weekend is Indy. And uh, nobody will be, I don't think the track will be open for, for that weekend. But Havana's close for us, so it's only 45 miles from us. So if we don't make it that weekend, we'll go down there on the 7th and test right before the, the match race. And we're just going to race Keith Jackson on the 14th. After that, I'm not sure. We'll just have to see where it goes from there. If we get all the bugs worked out of it, we'll be looking for some races. So you can... You can go see Tim go against Keith Jackson in the Pier Heaven on the 14th. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yep. Well, Tim, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking time to interview. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it, Dave. I hope I didn't bore everybody with death. Nah, you, I'm sure you. they all enjoy, enjoyed all the info you gave. You don't realize all the stories that you've got until you really start thinking about it, how long I've been doing it. Man, <laughs> there must be something wrong with me. <laughs> I get you both people think, what was wrong with that guy? You know? <laughs> yeah. It's been a long time. So. Well, I wish you the best of luck with the rest of the season. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dave. And uh, we'll, do another right. one. we'll do another one in the future and I'll get an update on you. So you have a great night, Tim. Okay, thank you, Dave. Okay, bye-bye. Uh-huh.